Hey, thanks for tuning into the podcast. And before it begins, I have a favor to ask. I'd love to hear your honest feedback about the podcast. So please call our listener line at 631 800 631-800-3579. Leave a message and let me know your thoughts. The show description also has my contact information. Okay, now on with the show. Welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast, where we explore the muse and the music from the North Shore to the South Shore, from New York City to the Hamptons. Navigating the wellspring of original music from singer-songwriters and musicians from Long Island, New York. Hi, I'm Steve Yusko from GigDestiny.com. Stay tuned as we explore the Long Island Sound. In today's episode, we meet Mark Newman. This eight-string man hit the big stage with Sam the Sham when he was 23. But what really amazed me was his original songs and backstory. I discovered a warm, familiar voice and music that resonated in my wheelhouse. Have a listen to One More Song About a Highway, then come join the conversation. So I'm out. 
As a kid growing up on Long Island, my dad would chastise us for changing the station from station to station on the car radio to find music we wanted to hear. As I navigate the musical waters of the Long Island Sound, more often than not, I'm blessed to find some great music well up in my wheelhouse. And that's exactly how I felt as I experienced Mark Newman's music. Mark has been around the world, and yet he has a voice that seems to be familiar like a comforting old friend. He's both a singer, songwriter, and ace string man, sharing the stage with such notables as soul legend Sam Moore of Sam and Dave, John Oates of Hall & Oates, Jim McCarty of the Yardbirds, and the late Will DeVille of Mink DeVille, Bobby Whitlock of Derek and the Dominoes, and Sam the Sham. As luck would have it, I met Mark during an event in Riverhead featuring Matt Marshak, an earlier guest. And man, what a great chance for my wife and I to hear some really awesome tunes and string men who took us along for the ride. There's so much more to unpack here. Mark Newman, welcome to the Long Island Sound. Good to have you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I I tell you, um, it's funny. I've been really fortunate to uh, meet some really great guys. And, um, And this is all bullshit aside. I've been listening to your songs for three days and... When I, I when I said <laughs> I do a little bit of homework, but it was easy because it's the type it's in my wheelhouse. It's exactly the type of music I love. So this is I'm excited about this interview. It just thanks. I, I, I love what you do. You're you're a blues man and and virtuoso in a lot of different things and the slide guitar and it just I can reminisce about the different sounds. But you, you're very unique in in what you do. So uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we heard uh, one of your songs in, in the beginning of the podcast. We'll hear two more. I love the song Tulsa. I, th- I thought it was great. It really kind of welled up a lot of Im- images to me about current events, uh, unfortunately or fortunately. But True. So you grew up in the Bronx, right? Yeah, I was I was born in the Bronx. Um, and then my family moved out to Massapequa in the okay. 50s. Yeah. Nice. All right. So you're, you're, a, tr- you're a transplant. And, uh, yeah. you know... It amazes me all the different people that that settle on Long Island and and really uh, get the music out there. When when did you first pick up the instrument? When did you think, you know, what were your influences to say, hey, I think I can do this? Yeah. I don't know. I think it was just watching people on TV. My parents constantly had the radio on. There was always music in the house, and my father would sit down at the piano and uh, play the same thing that everybody else's father played. You know, if they couldn't play. that that one that one with the knuckles (laughs) and um that and uh heart and soul was a big one so i started fooling around with the piano but then i wanted to be a guitar player it just you know um i had a ukulele when i was a little kid and uh and then i started taking guitar lessons i never looked back so at, at what age what what age did you pick up the guitar sometime between eight and nine Really? Wow, that's great. I took breaks. I mean, when I when I was in high school, I was in bands. When I wasn't playing on a regular basis, the guitar would sit there. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, once I knew we were at gigging, I'd be practicing, not doing my homework, you know, things like that. Right, right. So, yeah. What's interesting is the events, you know, you got to dance or whatever's coming up and, and you, you've, you've got to woodshed it, so to speak, to to bring your craft up to speed, you know. And I, yeah. And I know there's a lot of a lot of guys and gals who listen who are probably looking at a guitar in the corner of their room that has a lot of dust and needs the strings changed and what have you. Because I I went through the same thing. It was too damn hard <laughs> in the beginning for me. And what what helped me maybe helps a lot of people. Um, and I began later in life was uh, seeing how how to do chord structures and stuff like that, you know, and and go for that. So what was your what was your first band? I mean, so you're. Now you're in high school. I guess you're getting pretty good at it. So you stuck to guitar in high school, and yeah, I had a band with uh, with a few friends uh, from another school district, and um, trying to remember the name of that band. I think it was called the Starlights. And interestingly enough, Joey D and the Starlighters were like well, way before that. And mm-hmm. James, if you watch the uh, James Brown movie, Get On Up. They okay. were. They had a similar name, the Starlights, and then they go and sit in with um, uh, Little Richard takes a break in the movie. Okay. And they're about to announce their names, and James Brown just jumps to the mic and said, "We're the Famous Flames." So they were no longer the Starlights. <laughs> just, just like that. <laughs> I think I have it right. I'm not. 
you know, don't don't hold me to it, but I'm pretty sure that's that's what it was. Well, I got I got to definitely look that movie up because um, it's great. You know, it's, I, I would assume, you know, I was looking at your bio and where you've been and, and the different uh, real real celebrities in the industry that you played with. I'm thinking, all right, this is a Brooklyn, Manhattan guy and he's right in the center of it. But but you went from the Bronx to Massapequa. But I I did spend a lot of time. I lived in L.A. for five years. And when I came back to New oh. York, I uh, I spent most of my time in Manhattan playing clubs. OK, so that that, that was really where the. Uh, that's really where you, you grew your craft was uh, in the center of the world, Manhattan. Yeah. We'd be playing like six times a month on Bleecker street. Um, Kenny's castaways and the bitter end, bitter end is still there. It's yeah. Still, it's still my favorite place to play. Yeah. What's what's for those who don't know the bitter end, very famous place It's a very narrow place. Um, yeah. If, if I recall, right. You have, you have a very long stage on one side of the wall, brick wall. Right. And, uh, it's sort of in the basement, right? As, as you go down the steps. Um, no, actually, it's, uh, it's straight it, in. It's it's ground level. See, I yeah. must have been I must have been drinking too much when I, <laughs> when I went there. There are other clubs like that, though. Yeah, yeah, right around there. But it's a, it's a great place, and and uh, and a lot of people. I don't even know how they approach it now. Do people like pay to play there, or or you know? No, you play for the door, basically. Basically, play for the door. What you can what you can drag in. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the what was the big leap for you to play with the people that you played with? I mean, how did that how did that come about? And let me let me just give a prerequisite to that. There's thousands of musicians who never get a break to really go out there and and I'm always interested in what do you think was what gave you the opportunity and the chance to do it? When I lived in LA, I was working with uh two guys that were in the band Sweetwater and they were the only electric band that played Woodstock on the first night. Okay. Oh, wow. They were, I don't know, probably about 10 years older than me. And, uh, they were, uh, very kind to take me into, you know, I played with the keyboard player and the bass player. They were the, you know, two of the original guys. I'm still friends with them to this day. Oh, nice. A lot of people, uh, used, uh, this guy, Mutt Cohen to administer their publishing. So uh, my friend, you know, had publishing things to deal with, you know, from when he was in Sweetwater. And he ran into Sam the Sham at the bank. They knew each other. And Sam said uh, in his southern drawl, he said, yeah, man, I, I'm looking for a slide guitar player. So my friend calls me up and says, hey, Sam the Sham's looking for a slide guitar player. You play slide, right? And I went, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I get a. I really didn't expect to hear anything. And I get a call a couple of weeks later and, uh, this guy says, Hey, is this Mark? This is Sam the sham. And I'm going, <laughs> Fred, cut it out, man. You know, like <laughs> it's not funny. Yeah. Quit BSing me here. Right. Yeah. It was him. He invited me over to his place. We sat around his kitchen table playing guitar, um, till about two in the morning. And then he said, Hey, you want to do a gig with me tomorrow? Tomorrow, was, the next day? Wow. The next day. So <laughs> I knew Wooly Bully, so I couldn't miss. I knew right, Little right. Red Riding Hood, and the rest mm -hmm. of it was like a blues gig. Oh, wow. Now, and, how old how, how old are you when you got this break? 23 or 4. Okay. Young man, really. Yeah. Yeah. And gold, golden opportunity. So – so he takes you for this test drive till two in the morning. And I would assume not only to test your chops, but test your endurance till two in the morning. Not only that, but in between <laughs> playing, in between playing, he had a mortar and pestle and he was grinding chili peppers to make hot sauce. Oh my God. Where, yeah. where is he from? Was he from like Louisiana or something like that? Or? Well, he, he came up in Louisiana, but he's originally, originally from Irving, Texas. Okay. Um, that's in between Dallas and Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. It's actually part of Dallas and um, it's not far from the airport. He grew up in Dallas and he started playing in Dallas and he's the only guy that I know personally that can say this. He played Jack Ruby's nightclub in the sixties. Oh, wow. That's what I wow. said. <laughs> wow. Holy mackerel. I know. And then he went, wound up going to Louisiana and doing a bunch of gigs there. And then he was, they got a record deal with a smaller label out of Memphis mm -hmm. and he moved to Memphis and uh, Rufus Thomas really helped him out. 
the guy that did Walking the Dog. Okay, okay. Um, he helped them get airplay. He's he was a DJ for a while. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, and then MGM picked up the contract or bought the contract from whoever had it originally, and he had he had quite a long career. I mean, even after he wasn't in the mainstream, he was touring the world. Really? So yeah. at at that point, when you when you when you do the the gig with him the next day. Are, man, are you in the band? Is it, is it, was it a chance meeting or like, you know, what was it, what was your relationship, I guess is my point? Uh, we hit it up pretty well. I, I wound up being in his band from that point on. Wow. So, so you, you hit the world circuit or, you know, was it? Well, mostly in the States, mostly on the West Coast. We'd play in New York once in a while. Um, played Memphis. Um, I didn't go out of the country with him until sometime in the 90s actually because hmm. he moved from la back to memphis i stayed in touch with him and he called me and asked me if i wanted to do a gig in antwerp in belgium really? yeah so okay. i did a couple yeah a couple of gigs there a couple of gigs in berlin with him that was uh late 90s and then uh in 2000 uh, i played a few gigs in europe with him how did the belgian people you take them i mean you know was he part of a, well, an ensemble or you know just like they you know fell in love with them or you know how was it well they had ba they had uh, a backup band for everybody and um so somewhere halfway between halfway during the show there were a lot of acts on the bill sam says i know not all you can understand me because you all speak french <laughs> now Apparently that's a sore point because he got booed. <laughs> most of most of the people they speak English, and the okay. ones that don't in in that part of the country they speak Flemish. Okay. So it's only around the French border that they speak French. Boy, how to, how to lose a crowd when you don't know who you're singing to, right? <laughs> I wanted to hide behind the amp. You know? <laughs> Start playing quick, right? Yep. <laughs> hey, let's do this. I just want to I just want to take a quick break and then. Uh, when we come back, I really want to ask you, I think a, a lot of the up and coming artists want to know, you know, what did you, what did you learn in, you know, from Sam and, and your early tours out uh, around the world? Like, what'd you pick up? Uh, so why don't we take a quick break and we'll be right back with Mark Newman. Stick with us. Hi, Steve Yusko from Gig Destiny here. Well, as you're probably listening to this podcast, you're probably thinking about that musician would make a fantastic guest here on the Long Island Sound. But well, we'd like to hear their story. We'd like to hear their music. So have them reach out to us at gigdestiny.com and we'll explore their craft. Now, back to our podcast. Hey, everybody. We're back with Mark Newman. Uh, and I said this before, and I'm going to say it again. His music is exactly in my wheelhouse. I love the slide guitar. I love the blues. I love everything about your music, and I, I don't say I don't say that to every musician, but it just you know, I'm listening and I'm thinking like Tedeschi trucks. Okay, this is like oh man, I like this. this. You know, it was just really kind of struck me, and it was it was cool to to discover this for myself. You know, and uh, what what uh, I know I'm a jabbermouth here, but what I like about podcasts is I'm getting to discover guys that are my own neighbors on Long Island who have phenomenal music. And, uh, you know, uh, it gets hidden in, uh, in Spotify and everything else, uh, you know, unless you get your chance to see you guys out live, which you do play live a, a lot. So we'll talk about that. But one question I have for you is sure. what did you learn early in your career? You know, you, you get this great opportunity with Sam the Sham. You know, what, what, were, you, what were your takeaways? What kind of set you on, on a good course or a bad course? I don't know. Well, Sam used to turn around, you know, again, I was either 23 or 24. And uh, I had just moved to L.A. And, you know, you go through that thing when you're young about trying to play as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And he'd yell at me, he'd go, calm down. You know, like. <laughs> um, he was and, very direct. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he would send me home with, with blues records like Jimmy Reed uh, or, you know, and he'd say, man, go home and listen to this. He was he was very nice about it. But he, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I got the gig because I could play slide. But when I, you know, again, I'd be playing regular guitar also, trying to get every 
every lick I could in there and saw what it's about. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's about the spaces between the notes that make, uh, make them dwell longer, you know, and it's about paying attention to what the singer is doing. Right. So you don't, you don't overshadow, you compliment it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other, the other thing that amazed me. So I, 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 I had met you, uh, Matt Marshak introduced me out in Riverhead and lo and behold, I, I, I didn't know who you were and, you know, he calls you out of the audience and uh, you're like the third guitar player in the, the trio that was up there. And you, 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 you fit like a glove, man. It's just kind of, it was, it was kind well, of neat. You know? To be fair, I've played with Chris and Ma- and Matt and okay. Peter Kahlo, um quite a few times. So it okay. wasn't very hard. Okay. So I wasn't just uh, trying to figure everything out. No. You know, as you went. Yeah. But it was, it was a great night. It was really, uh, and, and for those who are listening, Look up the Matt Marshak episode. It was a fun episode. <laughs> so I love uh, Matt. They're great. He's yeah. a great guy. Yeah. So all right. So now you bridge. So let's bridge off of. Um, I, I want to talk about the song that I in- introduced before we even started talking together, and it's it's called "One More Song About a Highway." Uh, can you just tell me how that came about? Because I'm always curious how the muse strikes you. Do you collaborate? Are you the sole lyricist and music writer? You know, how do you approach it? Usually that's the case. Um, you know, it's just, I, with that, I started with, with the, uh, the opening riff and then, and then just built it from there. And one of my friends, actually the guy that owns my label said to me, man, that sounds like a great driving song. And I, I thought about it. And then I thought about all these guys that are truckers and what makes them go that kind of life. And mm. a lot of them just couldn't find work. I, I'm sure that's not the, some people like that lifestyle, but there are people who take gigs like that, that they can't get work in their hometown. Right. So I just created this story about a guy who gets laid off and he can't find work. I even make a joke in the second verse about um, the CIA wouldn't have me. The local <laughs> crime boss said, <clears throat> you're out of luck. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the guy goes, he goes to both extremes trying to, you know, work within the law and then outside the law. And right. Winds up, winds up really missing his family because he's on the road for like, you know, weeks. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I can appreciate that, you know, certainly in, in my career, or early in my career and in, in my marriage, you know, I traveled 75% of the time. And, you know, one of the instincts is you come home. And the master bedroom is is not as familiar as the the Hampton Inn room you know, that you're in, you know, <laughs> three or four nights a week, you know, uh, yep. uh, and you know, and one of the things you long, at least for me, uh, and I'm not to get too philosophical, but you long for a community, and uh, you know, when you're out on your own, you know, you find community at the truck stop, you find it wherever. Um, but I felt this disconnection from my hometown, and then later in life, I was for you know, and that and that's what I look for is the community. And that's what I think it probably is with a band when you're on the road, you know, it's a family, you know, and it's a community, you know, it is, it is. When I was with Willie DeVille, um, we toured like six weeks at a time in Europe. So, um, that's who you're hanging out with all the time. Yeah. Yeah. If for good or for bad, right. You know, you certainly, no, it was about, usually, yeah. usually pretty good. Yeah. How, now, how did you go from, uh, Sam the Sham to uh, Mink DeVille. Well, there was also stuff in between. I wound up playing. Okay. With, um, I wound up getting the gig with Sam Moore. Um, wow. And I knew all that music because I played all of it when I was a kid. Mm. So uh, I was him, with him for 10 years. Wow. And uh, the bass player who was the music director uh, was in a band that had a jam every Monday night. And I sat in and he took my phone number. And then like two years later called me and asked me if I wanted to do the gig. Just out whoever, of the blue like that. Well, whoever had the gig couldn't make it. And he asked me to sub on the gig and through some course of events, I wound up having the gig. Wow. That's, that's great. <laughs> right. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, can, then, I can imagine. And then in between that, I wound up working with Willie DeVille and John Oates. Now, how did the uh, John Oates, when he, uh, so I, I know a whole of notes. So John Oates kind of went off on his own at, for a period of time. Or does he always have his own stuff for a while? Well, 
I Hall and Oates wanted to end on a good note. They were like at the top of the game. Yeah. And uh, they both decided to go uh, try solo endeavors. And, um, you know, the thing is, like, people want to see Hall and Oates. Uh, so um, Oates would play smaller venues, and Daryl had that show, Daryl's House, which was great. So yeah. I worked with Oates on his solo stuff, and he, he was really wanting to be more of an Americana artist. Hmm. So... He was trying, again, he was looking for a slide player. And my friend was the drummer in his band. And my friend said, hey, I know somebody. <laughs> um, Jerry Douglas played on his on his solo stuff. Um, and, you know, Jerry Douglas isn't going to go on tour when he's making a good living in the studio in, in Nashville. Right. Although, although he does he does tour a little bit. So. No, oh, interesting. Mostly so for his own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I would imagine, you know, Hall and Oates together, you know, they were, they were so impactful with the Philly sound and everything like that. And, and just great, great stuff to listen to. But then when you break up that marriage, you know, how does the audience react to it? I guess is, you know, you know, they're screaming out. I could just imagine him screaming out Hall and Oates songs where he's like, I want to do my own stuff. (laughs) Well, we did, we did John's stuff, you know, John Oates, we did his stuff. Mm-hmm. But he would have to play Hall and Oates tunes, but they wouldn't be exactly like the Hall and Oates arrangements. Right, right. And, and you know what? That, I I like that too because it it Me you too. know when I when I when I go to see a live concert and you know it sounds exactly like the album. Uh, to be frank, I'm kind of disappointed. You know, I I really want that ebb and flow and the tide back and forth between the audience and the energy. Uh, that's happening because it says, you know what, you're playing for me. You know, I'm pretty selfish when it comes to that. And that's that's what I think when, you know, you go to an audience uh, and you get the feedback from it. I can only imagine, I, you know, I'm the hopeful guy in the audience, not on stage. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which my wife is very happy about. My wife is actually freaking out because I'm actually in front of a microphone, which is, I think, her nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, – I want to talk about the next song from me to you, how that was developed, and and then we'll uh, we'll take a break and listen to it, have the audience check it out. Okay, <clears throat> I didn't write that song. <clears throat> now, uh, the label I'm signed to, the distribution company, they're in Nashville, and Janice Ian, who wrote that song, it was on her nineties, was it, nineteen seventy five album from uh, called Between the Lines. Okay. Anyway. The distributor called me and asked me if I would cover this song that Janice Ian had just written. And she wanted, she was trying to get as as many people as she could to cover this song. It was called Better Times, uh, Better Times Will Come. Okay. And she has a Facebook page, The Better Times Project. So a lot of people covered the song. And um, anyway, then I remembered uh, hearing this, this song on that old album. From me to you, and I decided to cover that as well. Wow, that's interesting. That's a great. That's a. That's an interesting way to approach it, as far as getting other artists to, to cover. You know, you want them to cover your stuff. Um, sure. And uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, I'll have to ask other musicians how they feel about you know, uh, letting other people cover their music. You know. Why wouldn't they? Yeah, get it out there, right? That's right. Yeah. You know. But, it's, you know. It's, uh, a lot of people, um, the, the group Badfinger, um, they wrote. I think Pete Ham wrote. Uh, I can't uh, live. I can't live. Uh, oh yeah, I, I, yeah. Can't live Harry Nilsson. Harry mm-hmm. Nilsson had the hit with it. So, you know, yeah. th- there's a lot of situations like that. Yeah, where it's you know right timing, right person, you know, yeah. right approach to it. Hey, the song lives on in a lot of different voices. And you know right. what? That, that's, that's uh, you know, most musicians that I speak to are very collaborative and, and, you know, freewheeling and share the stage. And it's not just me on the limelight. There are a few that are not like that. And that's just life, you know, that gets in the way with that. But I can just tell you with this podcast, which is great, it leads me to three to five people, interesting people. That say, oh, man, if you think, you know, you enjoyed this, you got to talk to this guy or this gal and stuff like that. Sure. And, and it's a nice community. <laughs> I just, I'm just kind oh, of yeah. a big fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> you know, just listen to it. So why don't we do this? Let's uh, let's take a listen to "From Me to You," and we'll be right back after the song.
not beg for me as I would not beg for you. back everybody and that was really great song i really appreciate you bringing that to the the table for us so um thanks yeah so so tell us what are you doing nowadays mark you know what what do you got planned i mean uh you're still recording i know you said you're doing some recording today and and uh you know what what what's coming up in the next few months with you i'm almost done with my new cd almost i'm touring with a band called the hitmen which is a bunch of guys that are all sidemen for for famous people. Okay. Either they are now or they have been. And in fact, I have to go to Wisconsin tomorrow. Oh, really? um, oh my God. I know. It's still winter there. What the heck's matter with you? <laughs> I know. Well, you know, it, it's like they had, I, I entered a contest. It was like first prize was a week in Wisconsin. Second prize was two weeks. <laughs> so Dude, no, I'm Dude. doing it. I've been playing with all these guys, with these guys. They're all friends of mine. And they asked me to, you know, uh, they asked me to join the band. Um, that's great. Because I had, because I had played with a few famous people and that's, that's pretty much a prerequisite for being in the band. And you have to be able, you have to be able to play, of course. So <laughs> right. yeah, you can't, can't forget what you learned. Right. Right. And what we'll do just for our audience, you know, information on, on Mark and, You'll have, we have his website and, and the Hitman. Anything we talk about, you can find it in the chapter marks, and uh, no pun intended, um, to, to get links to all the different information that we're, we're talking about and, and, to, uh, and to Mark's music uh, as well. Because I'm telling you, if you're like me and you discover it, you're going to get a lot more fans out of this because uh, just really kind of great stuff. 
Well, you can find it any. I mean, it, it's on all the uh, all the usual places. You know, Spotify. Um, like if you're a member of one of those things. In fact, mm-hmm. my last my last CD was called Empirical Truth, and um, I had no idea that you could buy the CD on Amazon. I had no clue. Um, really? I, yeah, I thought I signed a, just a a digital distribution deal with this company, uh, WBA Records, out of okay. Nashville. So um, I was selling CDs at gigs, but you can actually get the physical CD on Amazon. Just type in my name and Empirical Truth, and you you know they'll send you the physical CD. But um, all this music, and that's like my fourth CD. Hmm. Um, it's all on the usual sites. Um, Spotify, you can find that all on iTunes. And, right. We'll have uh, we'll have we'll have links for all that. I mean, I was in my I was <laughs> I was in my kitchen uh, and and Debbie was preparing dinner and I said, "You got to hear this song." And I'm like, "Hey Google, you know, uh, I can't talk because Google's in my room now. Uh, play the song we're going to talk about." And then uh, and I played it and she's like, "Yeah, that's pretty cool. How, how do you how do you find people like this?" <laughs> that's that's Google. Hey Google, stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, too many people listening. No, not the audience. I'm talking about my electronics in the, in the room here. <laughs> yeah, when my electronics talk back to me, that's when I leave the room. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, you know, you're still alive, you know, when your electronics are talking to you, I guess. Uh-huh. I, I'm just, I just had to unplug him or her or whatever it is. <laughs> so Wisconsin, how long will you be in Wisconsin? Just for a couple of days? And, uh, no, um, yeah. I leave tomorrow. I'll be back Sunday. The gig Great. is on Saturday. Nice. So nice. Um, then when I get back, I'm playing... Um, I'm playing the Montauk Music Festival. Oh, um, great! I'll be on the main stage on uh, on May 21st at like 4:30, I think. Okay. With, you know, with my band, I'll be doing some solo gigs around there. You know, that's just a lot of fun. Oh, Mon- um, Montauk is great, and, and yeah. uh, I'm going to try to actually. It's my wife's birthday weekend. That might be a good if I can find a place to stay. Uh, I, I love Montauk. It's just a, oh, me just, too. It's just so unique, you know. It's 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 a it's a, a drinking village with a fishing problem, as they say. <laughs> well, I used to play the Memory Motel all the time, and uh, uh, they'd be cleaning up eyeballs and teeth at the end of the night because <laughs> you had all the fishermen coming in, and then you had a bunch of uh, like students from Ireland that were working in Montauk right. over the summer, and and then just you know the locals. And there'd be a fight every time we play there. Yeah, there's, a, there's another place. I don't know if you've been to Liar Saloon in Montauk. No, it's it's I'm another not. it's another as my father-in-law used to say, another potential to be a bucket of blood. You know, so watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's where they that's where they have the band behind the uh, the chicken wire. You know, so they can't break the bottles on your instruments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done that's, some of those too. Yeah, I, I well, you know what? I, I'm definitely going to have you back because we've got more stories to to explore with you, and and it's pretty fascinating, you know, who you've played played with. I want to talk. Uh, let's talk about it's 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 really important this 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 last song that you brought to the table. Um, tell us about Tulsa and and uh, how that came about and well, the anniversary that's coming up. I read an article about uh, the Tulsa massacre a few years ago, and we never learned about that in school. So the Tulsa massacre started with um, somebody from the Greenwood section of, of Tulsa, which was not the white section of town, mm-hmm. um, gets in an elevator with a, a young girl, and nobody knows if they knew each other, but she oh, I remember the story. Man. And things, things just escalated, and uh, uh, they wind up deputizing all these people and going into the black neighborhood. Um, yeah, I know the story. I'm supposed to say African American, but uh, Smokey Robinson said it's okay to say black. So okay, I'm saying black. that works. <laughs> if it's okay with him, it's okay <laughs> with me. So, um, and they they destroyed the Greenwood section, uh, killing a lot mm. of people. Not only did they go in with with firearms, but they bombed. I mean, from planes. Wow. Uh, they had. They were dropping bombs from from planes overhead, and uh, that's that area never came back. Right. And that was known as the Black Wall Street because you had all that's these right. 
all these veterans that came back from World War One, and it was a thriving community, and that didn't sit well with the white community either. And you know, and yeah, all they were in competition. Yeah, right. So um, anyway, that was uh, I think Memorial Day weekend a hundred years ago. Uh, from you know, hundred and one. Yeah, years you know, ago. it's interesting when you know a lot of times when you listen to his, his music that speaks to history. Uh, and, and when I, I was kind of struck by the song, cause I, I was thinking about Ukraine at the same time that I was thinking about Tulsa yeah. cause there was so many parallels of, Hey, we got to get the hell out of here type, type of thing. And I, I thought about, you know, refugees and, and what have you. So, um, unfortunately history repeats itself and, um, we have to be reminded to, to keep spreading the love and, and reducing the hate, get rid of the hate. So, um, uh, anyway, on that note, let's, let's take a listen to Tulsa. And we'll be right back.
Hey everybody, we are back, and that is, I must have listened, I'm not kidding, I listened to this song probably 10 times in the past three days, getting prepped for this uh, this episode, and it's 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 a very striking song, and, and thanks for sharing it with us, man, it's great. Oh, thanks for listening. You know, so I'm curious about um, your, your recording process, you know, you said you did some things at home, but, you know, to, tell, tell the gang out there, you know, how you approach things, you know. Um, I usually go in the studio with my drummer, Sean Murray, and, um, <clears throat> and you know, lay things down, guitar and drums, and then build it from there. I, um, I usually go to, <clears throat> excuse me, Tiki Recording in Glen Cove. Okay. Uh, Fred, Fred Guarino is the engineer. I've been working with him forever. Nice. And yeah, he's you, great. You got to find somebody with great ears who can point things out to you that you may not catch, right? Oh, so, and uh, he does. <laughs> and he's not shy about it. I can tell by your not, smile. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so, so what? What other events? What other gigs you got? Uh, uh, you know, you're not going to be stuck in Wisconsin. You're going to bring no. me back some. Che- you got to bring back some cheese because I uh, got to get. Some, I got to get something out of this. And uh, what's up next? <laughs> um, let's see. So I'm playing the Montauk Music Festival in June. I'm playing at Still Partners in Seacliff on June 17. And I love playing Still Partners because it's one of the few venues on Long Island that, that has original bands there, like on a mm. weekend. Is that like right on the main street in uh, Seacliff? Yeah, it's on Seacliff Avenue. Okay. And um, it's a great place. The food is great. And it's just a fun place to play. And uh, after that, I'm playing at Great South Bay on the Saturday, playing with a group called Sail and Shoes. It's a Little Feet tribute band. You know, that's probably my favorite band. Great band, still playing around, right? Yep. Yeah. So it's a tribute yep. band. That, that's great. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that um, Great South Bay event. I mean, it really looks like it's going to be very diverse. Tedeschi Trucks, I think, is one of the main liners. Um, that's right. That's going to be playing there, and I'm just amazed by that band. You know, every oh, day, yeah. uh, husband and wife, and just the big band. It just, it's just. Uh, if you don't know them, check them out. Tedeschi Trucks, great, yep. phenomenal slide guitar player, you know, extraordinary, right? Yeah, oh, he's great. Uh, Mark, I really want to thank you for your time. Uh, I really want to have Thanks you back having... because I'd I, love you know, to. You got like you got you got to have like ten thousand more stories, and especially after what's coming up, you're going to have to come back and tell me what happened here on Long Island with the different shows and stuff. And uh, right. I'd love to have you back. And I end up, I end my podcast a lot this way. And a good friend told me, he goes, you know, we can account for what we have in our bank accounts or what we own. We can never account for what time we have, uh, have left on this earth. So when you give me an hour of your time, uh, it's very valuable. And I, pre- I appreciate it, brother. Oh, I'd love to do it again. All right, man. So until next time, check All out right. Mark Newman and uh, peace, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Until next time, be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Thank you for listening, and please support our musicians. If you like the podcast, please rate, comment, and subscribe. If you want to partner with us, visit gigdestiny.com. Hit that donate button. We appreciate your support to keep the conversation alive. Take care. Be well.